Part 1, Chapter 1 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Part 1, Chapter 1. 1. I cannot resist sitting down to write the history of the first steps in my career, though I might very well abstain from doing so. I know one thing for certain. I shall never again sit down to write my autobiography, even if I live to be a hundred. One must be too disgustingly in love with self to be able, without shame, to write about oneself. I can only excuse myself on the ground that I am not writing with the same object with which other people write, that is, to win the praise of my readers. It has suddenly occurred to me to write out word for word all that has happened to me during this last year, simply from an inward impulse, because I'm so impressed by all that has happened. I shall simply record the incidents, doing my utmost to exclude everything extraneous, especially all literary graces. The professional writer writes for 30 years and is quite unable to say at the end why he has been writing for all that time. I'm not a professional writer and don't want to be. And to drag forth into the literary marketplace the inmost secrets of my soul and an artistic description of my feelings, I should regard as indecent and contemptible. I foresee, however, with vexation, that it will be impossible to avoid describing feelings altogether and making reflections, even perhaps cheap ones, so corrupting is every sort of literary pursuit in its effect, even if it be undertaken only for one's own satisfaction. The reflections may indeed be very cheap, because what is of value for oneself may very well have no value for others. But all this is beside the mark. It will do for a preface, however. There will be nothing more of the sort. Let us get to work, though there is nothing more difficult than to begin upon some sorts of work. Perhaps any sort of work. 2. I am beginning, or rather I should like to begin, these notes from the 19th of September of last year. That is, from the very day I first met, but to explain so prematurely who it was I met before anything else is known would be cheap. In fact, I believe my tone is cheap. I vowed I would eschew all literary graces and here at the first sentence I am being seduced by them. It seems as if writing sensibly can't be done simply by wanting to. I may remark also that I fancy writing is more difficult in Russian than in any other European language. I am now reading over what I have just written, and I see that I am much cleverer than what I have written. How is it that what is expressed by a clever man is much more stupid than what is left in him? I have more than once during this momentous year noticed this with myself and my relations with people, and have been very much worried by it. Although I am beginning from the 19th of September, I must put in a word or two about who I am and where I had been till then, and what was consequently my state of mind on the morning of that day to make things clearer to the reader, and perhaps to myself also. 3. I have passed the leaving examination at the grammar school, and now I am in my 21st year. My surname is Dolgoruki, and my legal father is Makar Ivanov Dolgoruki formerly a serf in the household of the Versalovs. In this way, I am a legitimate son, although I am, as a matter of fact, conspicuously illegitimate, and there is not the faintest doubt about my origin. The facts are as follows. Twenty-two years ago, Versalov, that is, my father, being twenty-five years old, visited his estate in the province of Tula. I imagine that at that time his character was still quite unformed. It is curious that this man, who... Even in my childhood, made such an impression upon me, who had such a crucial influence on the whole bent of my mind, and who perhaps has even cast his shadow over the whole of my future, still remains, even now, a complete enigma to me in many respects. Of this, more particulars later. There is no describing him straight off. My whole manuscript will be full of this man anyway. He had just been left a widower at that time, that is, when he was 25. He had married one of the Fanariotovs, a girl of high rank, but without much money. And by her hand he had a son and a daughter. The facts that I have gathered about this wife whom he lost so early are somewhat scanty, 
and are lost among my materials, and, indeed, many of the circumstances of Versilov's private life have eluded me, for he has always been so proud, disdainful, reserved, and casual with me, in spite of a sort of meekness towards me, which was striking at times. I will mention, however, to make things clear beforehand, that he ran through three fortunes in his lifetime, very big ones, too, of over 1,400 souls, and maybe more. Now, of course, he has not a farthing. He went to the village on that occasion, God knows why, so at least he said to me afterwards. His young children were, as usual, not with him, but with relations. This was always his method with his children, legitimate and illegitimate alike. The house serfs on this estate were rather numerous, and among them was a gardener called Makar Ivanov Dolgoruki. Here I will note in parenthesis, to relieve my mind once and for all, I doubt whether anyone can ever have raged against his surname as I have all my life. This is stupid, of course, but so it has been. Every time I entered a school or met persons whom I had to treat with respect as my elders, every wretched little teacher, tutor, priest, anyone you like, on asking my name and hearing it was Dolgoruki, for some reason invariably thought fitting to add Prince Dolgoruki, and every single time I was forced to explain to these futile people, no, simply Dolgoruki. That simply began to drive me mad at last. Here I note as a curious phenomenon that I don't remember a single exception. Everyone asked the question. For some, it was apparently quite superfluous, and indeed, I don't know how the devil it could have been necessary for anyone. But all, every one of them asked it. On hearing that I was simply Dolgoruki, the questioner usually looked me up and down with a blank and stupidly apathetic stare that betrayed that he did not know why he had asked the question. Then he would walk away. My comrades and schoolfellows were the most insulting of all. How do schoolboys question a newcomer? The new boy, abashed and confused on the first day of entering a school, whatever school it may be, is the victim of all. They order him about, they tease him, and treat him like a lackey. A stout, chubby urchin suddenly stands still before his victim and watches him persistently for some moments with a stern and haughty stare. The new boy stands facing him in silence, looks at him out of the corner of his eyes, and if he is not a coward, waits to see what is going to happen. What's your name? Dolgoruki. Prince Dolgoruki? No, simply Dolgoruki. Ah, simply fool! And he was right. Nothing could be more foolish than to be called Dolgoruki without being a prince. I have to bear the burden of that foolishness through no fault of my own. Later on, when I began to get very cross about it, I always answered the question, Are you a prince? By saying, No, I'm the son of a servant, formerly a serf. At last, when I was roused to the utmost pitch of fury, I resolutely answered, No, simply Dolgoruki, the illegitimate son of my former owner. I thought of this when I was in the sixth form of grammar school, and though I was very soon after thoroughly convinced that I was stupid, I did not at once give up being so. I remember that one of the teachers opined, he was alone in his opinion, however, that I was filled with ideas of vengeance and civic rights. As a rule, this reply was received with a sort of meditative pensiveness, anything but flattering to me. At last, one of my schoolfellows, a very sarcastic boy to whom I hardly talked once in a year, said to me with a serious countenance looking a little away, Such sentiments do you credit, of course, and no doubt you have something to be proud of, but if I were in your place, I should not be too festive over being illegitimate. You seem to expect congratulations. From that time forth, I dropped boasting of being illegitimate. I repeat, it is very difficult to write in Russian. Here I have covered three pages with describing how furious I have been all my life with my surname. And after all, the reader will, no doubt, probably have deduced that I was really furious at not being a prince, but simply Dolgoruki. To explain again and defend myself would be humiliating. 4. And so among the servants, of whom there were a great number besides Makar Ivanich, there was a maid, and she was 18 when Makar Dolgoruki, 
who was 50, suddenly announced his intention of marrying her. In the days of serfdom marriages of house serfs, as everyone knows, only took place with the sanction of their masters, and were sometimes simply arranged by the latter. At that time, Auntie was living on the estate. Not that she was my aunt, though. She had, in fact, an estate of her own. But I don't know why everyone knew her all her life as Auntie. Not mine in particular, but an aunt in general. Even in the family of Versilov, to whom she can hardly have been related. Her name was Tatiana Pavlovna Prutkov. In those days, she still had, in the same province and district, a property of 35 serfs of her own. She didn't exactly administer Versilov's estate of 500 serfs, but being so near a neighbor, she kept a vigilant eye on it, and her superintendence, so I have heard, was as efficient as that of any trained steward. However, her efficiency has nothing to do with me, but to dispose of all suspicion of cringing or flattery on my part, I should like to add that this Tatiana Pavlovna was a generous and even original person. Well, far from checking the gloomy Makar Dolgoruki's matrimonial inclinations, I am told he was gloomy in those days, she gave them the warmest encouragement. Sofia Andreevna, the serf girl of 18, that is, my mother, had been for some years fatherless and motherless. Her father, also a serf, who had a great respect for Makar Dolgoruki, and was under some obligation to him, had, six years before, on his deathbed, beckoned to the old gardener, and pointing significantly to his daughter, had, in the presence of the priest and all the servants, bequeathed her to him, saying, when she's grown up, marry her. This was, so they say, a quarter of an hour before he expired, so that it might, if need be, have been put down to delirium. Besides which, he had no right to dispose of property, being a serf, Everyone heard his words. As for Makar Ivanovich, I don't know in what spirit he afterwards entered upon the marriage, whether with great eagerness or simply as the fulfillment of a duty. Probably he preserved an appearance of complete indifference. He was a man who even at that time knew how to keep up his dignity. It was not that he was a particularly well-educated or reading man, though he knew the whole of the church service and some lives of the saints, but this was only from hearing them. It was not that he was a sort of backstairs philosopher. It was simply that he was a man of obstinate and even at times rash character, was conceited in his talk, autocratic in his judgment, and respectful in his life, to use his own surprising expression. That is what he was like at that time. Of course, he was universally respected, but I am told disliked by everyone. It was a different matter when he ceased to be a house serf. Then he was spoken about as a saint and a man who had suffered much. That I know for a fact. As for my mother, Tatiana Pavlovna had kept her till the age of 18 in her house, although the steward had urged that the girl should be sent to Moscow to be trained. She had given the orphan some education, that is, taught her sewing and cutting out clothes, ladylike deportment, and even a little reading. My mother was never able to write decently. She looked upon this marriage with Makar Ivanovich as something settled long ago, and everything that happened to her in those days she considered very good, and all for the best. She went to her wedding looking as unmoved as anyone could on such an occasion, so much so that even Tatiana Pavlovna called her a fish. All this about my mother's character at that time I heard from Tatiana Pavlovna herself. Versilov arrived just six months after this wedding. It, five. I only want to say that I have never been able to find out or to guess to my own satisfaction what led up to everything between him and my mother. I'm quite ready to believe, as he himself assured me last year with a flushed face, though he talked of all this with the most unconstrained and flippant air, that there was no romance about it at all, that it had just happened. I believe that it did just happen, and that little phrase, just happened, is delightful, yet I always wanted to know how it could have come about. I have always hated that sort of nastiness all my life, and always shall. It's not simply a disgraceful curiosity on my part, of course. I may remark that I knew absolutely nothing of my mother till a year ago. For the sake of Versilov's comfort, I was sent away to strangers, but of that later. 
And so I can never picture what she looked like at that time. If she had not been at all pretty, what could a man such as Versilov was then have found attractive in her? This question is of importance to me because it throws a light on an extremely interesting side of that man's character. It is for that reason I ask it, and not from depravity. Gloomy and reserved as he always was, he told me himself on one occasion, with that charming candor which he used to produce from the devil knows where, it seemed to come out of his pocket when he saw it was indispensable, that at that time he was a very silly young puppy. Not that he was exactly sentimental, but just that he had lately read Poor Anton and Palinka Sachs, two literary works which exerted an immense humanizing influence on the younger generation of that day, he added that it was perhaps through poor Anton that he went to the country, and he added it with the utmost gravity. How did that silly puppy begin at first with my mother? I have suddenly realized that if I had a single reader, he would certainly be laughing at me as a most ridiculous raw youth, still stupidly innocent, putting himself forward to discuss and criticize what he knows nothing about. It is true that I know nothing about it, though I recognize that not at all with pride, for I know how stupid such an experience is in a great dolt of twenty. Only I would tell such a gentleman that he knows nothing about it himself, and I will prove it to him. It is true that I know nothing about women, and I don't want to either, for I shall always despise that sort of thing, and I have sworn I will all my life. But I know for certain, though, that some women fascinate by their beauty, or by anything you like, all in a minute, while you may ruminate over another for six months before you understand what is in her, and that to see through and love such a woman, it is not enough to look at her, it is not enough to be simply ready for anything. One must have a special gift besides. Of that, I am convinced, although I do know nothing about it. And if it were not true, it would mean degrading all women to the level of domestic animals and only keeping them about one as such. Possibly this is what very many people would like. I know from several sources that my mother was by no means a beauty, though I have never seen the portrait of her at that age which is in existence, so it was impossible to have fallen in love with her at first sight. Simply to amuse himself, Versilov might have pitched on someone else. And there was someone else in the house, an unmarried girl too, Anfisa Konstantinovna Sapashkov, a housemaid. To a man who had brought poor Anton with him to the country, it must have seemed shameful to take advantage of his signoral rights to violate the sanctity of a marriage, even that of his serf. For I repeat, he spoke with extreme seriousness of this poor Anton, only a few months ago, that is twenty years after the event. Why, poor Anton only had his horse taken from him, but this was a wife, so there must have been something peculiar in this case, and Mademoiselle Sapashkov was the loser by it, or rather, I should say, the gainer. I attacked him with all these questions, once or twice last year when it was possible to talk to him, for it wasn't always possible to talk to him. And in spite of all his society polish and the lapse of 20 years, I noticed that he winced, but I persisted. On one occasion, anyway, although he maintained the air of worldly superciliousness, which he invariably thought fit to assume with me, he muttered strangely that my mother was one of those defenseless people whom one does not fall in love with, quite the contrary, in fact, but whom one suddenly pities for their gentleness. Perhaps though one cannot tell what for, that no one ever knows, but one goes on pitying them. One pities them and grows fond of them. In fact, my dear boy, there are cases when one can't shake it off. That was what he told me, and if that was how it really happened, I could not look upon him as the silly puppy he had proclaimed himself. That is just what I wanted. He went on to assure me, however, that my mother loved him through servility. He positively pretended it was because he was her master. He lied, thinking this was chic. He lied against his conscience, against all honor and generosity. I have said all this, of course, as it were to the credit of my mother, but I have explained already that I knew nothing whatever of her as she was then. What is more, I know the rigidity of her environment. 
and the pitiful ideas in which she had become set from her childhood and to which she remained enslaved for the rest of her life. The misfortune happened, nevertheless. I must correct myself, by the way. Letting my fancy run away with me, I have forgotten the fact which I have ought to have stated first of all, that is, that the misfortune happened at the very outset. I hope that the reader will not be too squeamish to understand at once what I mean. In fact, it began with his exercising his seigneurial rights, although Mademoiselle Sapochkov was passed over. But here, in self-defense, I must declare at once that I am not contradicting myself, for good lord, what could a man like Versilov have talked about at that date with a person like my mother, even if he had felt the most overwhelming love for her? I have heard from depraved people that men and women very often come together without a word being uttered which is, of course, the last extreme of monstrous loathsomeness. Nevertheless, I do not see how Versilov could have begun differently with my mother if he had wanted to. Could he have begun by expounding Polinka Sachs to her? And besides, they had no thoughts to spare for Russian literature. On the contrary, from what he said, he let himself go once, they used to hide in corners, wait for each other on the stairs, fly apart like bouncing balls, with flushed cheeks if anyone passed by, and the tyrant slave owner trembled before the lowest scrubbing maid in spite of his seigneurial rights. And although it was at first an affair of master and servant, it was that, and yet not that, and after all, there is no really explaining it. In fact, the more you go into it, the more obscure it seems. The very depth and duration of their love makes it more mysterious, for it is a leading characteristic of such men as Versilov to abandon as soon as their object is attained. That did not happen, though. To transgress with an attractive, giddy flirt who was his serf, and my mother was not a flirt, was not only possible but inevitable for a depraved young puppy. And they were all depraved, every one of them, and progressives as well as the reactionaries, especially considering his romantic position as a young widower and his having nothing to do. But to love her all his life is too much. I cannot guarantee that he did love her, but he has dragged her about with him all his life. That's certain. I put a great many questions to my mother, but there is one most important which I may remark I did not venture to ask her directly though I got in such familiar terms with her last year, and what is more, like a coarse, ungrateful puppy, considering she had wronged me, I did not spare her feelings at all. This was the question. How she, after six months of marriage, crushed by her ideas of the sanctity of wedlock, crushed like some helpless fly, respecting her Makar Ivanovich as though he had been a god, how she could have brought herself in about a fortnight to such a sin. Was my mother a depraved woman, perhaps? On the contrary, I may say now at once that it is difficult to imagine anyone more pure-hearted than she was then, and has been all her life. The explanation may be, perhaps, that she scarcely knew what she was doing. I don't mean this in a sense in which lawyers nowadays urge this in defense of their thieves and murderers but was carried away by a violent emotion, which sometimes gains a fatal and tragic ascendancy when the victim is of a certain degree of simplicity. There is no telling. Perhaps she fell madly in love with the cut of his clothes, the Parisian style in which he parted his hair, his French accent, yes, French, though she didn't understand a word of it, the song he sang at the piano, she fell in love with something she had never seen or heard of, and he was very handsome, and fell in love with him straight away, once for all, hopelessly fell in love with him altogether, manners, song, and all. I have heard that this did sometimes happen to peasant girls in the days of serfdom, and to the most virtuous, too. I understand this, and the man is a scoundrel who puts it down to nothing but servility, and so perhaps this young man may have had enough direct power of fascination to attract a creature who had till then been so pure and who was of a different species, of an utterly different world, and to lead her on to such evident ruin, that it was to her ruin my mother, I hope, realized all her life. Only probably when she went to it, she did not think of ruin at all.
but that is how it always is with these defenseless creatures. They know it is ruin, and they rush upon it. Having sinned, they promptly repented. He told me flippantly that he sobbed on the shoulder of Makar Ivanovich, whom he sent for to his study expressly for the purpose. And she, she meanwhile was lying unconscious in some little back room in the servants' quarters. Six. But enough of questions and scandalous details. After paying Makar Ivanovich a sum of money for my mother, Versilov went away shortly afterwards, and ever since, as I have mentioned already, he dragged her about with him, almost everywhere he went, except at certain times when he absented himself for a considerable period. Then, as a rule, he left her in the care of auntie, that is, of Tatiana Pavlovna Prutkov, who always turned up on such occasions. They lived in Moscow, and also in other towns and villages, even abroad, and finally in Petersburg. Of all that later, though perhaps it is not worth recording, I will only mention that a year after my mother left Makar Ivanovich, I made my appearance, and a year later my sister, and ten or eleven years afterwards, a sickly child, my younger brother, who died a few months later. My mother's terrible confinement with this baby was the end of her good looks, so at least I was told. She began rapidly to grow older and feebler. But a correspondence with Makar Ivanovich was always kept up. Wherever the Versilovs were, whether they lived for some years in the same place or were moving about, Makar Ivanovich never failed to send news of himself to the family. Strange relations grew up, somewhat ceremonious and almost solemn. Among the gentry, there's always an element of something comic in such relations, I know. But there was nothing of the sort in this case. Letters were exchanged twice a year, never more, nor less frequently. And they were extraordinarily alike. I have seen them. There was scarcely anything personal in them. On the contrary, they were practically nothing but ceremonious statements of the most public incidents and the most public sentiments. If one may use such an expression of sentiments, First came news of his own health and inquiries about their health, then ceremonious hopes, greetings, and blessings. That was all. I believe that this publicity and impersonality is looked upon as the essence of propriety and good breeding among the peasants. To our much esteemed and respected spouse, Sofia Andreevna, we send our humblest greetings. We send to our beloved children our fatherly blessing, even unalterable. The children were mentioned by name, including me. I may remark here that Makar Ivanovich had so much wit as never to describe his high-born, most respected master Andrei Petrovich as his benefactor, though he did invariably, in each letter, send him his most humble greetings, beg for the continuance of his favor, and call down upon him the blessing of God. The answers to Makar Ivanovich were sent shortly after by my mother, and were always written in exactly the same style. Versilov, of course, took no part in the correspondence. Makar Ivanovich wrote from all parts of Russia, from the towns and monasteries in which he sometimes stayed for a considerable time. He'd become a pilgrim, as it is called. He never asked for anything, but he invariably turned up at home once in three years on a holiday, and stayed with my mother, who always, as it happened, had her own lodgings apart from Versilov's. Of this I shall have to say more later. Here I will only mention that Makar Ivanovich did not loll on the sofa in the drawing room, but always sat discreetly somewhere in the background. He never stayed for long, five days or a week. I have omitted to say that he had the greatest affection and respect for his surname Dolgoruki. Of course, this was ludicrous and stupidity. And what was most stupid was that he prized his name just because there were princes of the name. A strange, topsy-turvy idea. I have said that the family were always together, but I mean except for me, of course. I was like an outcast, and almost from my birth had been with strangers. But this was done with no special design, but simply because it had happened so. When I was born, my mother was still young and good-looking, and therefore necessary to Versilov. And a screaming child, of course, was always a nuisance especially when they were traveling. That was how it happened that until I was 19, I had scarcely seen my mother except on two or three brief occasions. It was not due to my mother's wishes, but to Versilov's lofty disregard for people. 7. 
Now for something quite different. A month earlier, that is a month before the 19th of September, I had made up my mind in Moscow to renounce them all and to retire into my own idea, finally. I record that expression, retire into my own idea, because that expression may explain my leading motive, my object in life. What that idea of mine is, of that there will be only too much said later. In the solitary years of my dreamy life in Moscow, it sprang up in my mind before I had left the sixth form of grammar school, and from that time perhaps never left me for an instant. It absorbed my whole existence. Till then I had lived in dreams. From my childhood upwards, I have lived in the world of dreams, always of a certain color. But after this great and all-absorbing idea turned up, my dreams gained in force, took a definite shape, and became rational instead of foolish. School did not hinder my dreams, and it did not hinder the idea either. I must add, however, that I came out badly in the leaving exam, though I had always been one of the first in all the forms up to the seventh, and this was a result of that same idea, a result of a false deduction from it, perhaps. So it was not schoolwork that hindered the idea, but the idea that hindered schoolwork, and it hindered university work, too. When I left school, I intended at once not only to cut myself off from my family completely, but from all the world if necessary, though I was only 19 at the time. I wrote through a suitable person to tell them to leave me entirely alone, not to send me any more money for my maintenance, and if possible to forget me altogether, that is, if they ever did remember me, and finally nothing would induce me to enter the university. An alternative presented itself from which there was no escaping, to refuse to enter the university and go on with my education, or to defer putting my idea into practice for another four years. I went for the idea without faltering, for I was absolutely resolved about it. In answer to my letter, which had not been addressed to him, Versilov, my father, whom I had only seen once for a moment when I was a boy of ten, though even in that moment he made a great impression upon me, summoned me to Petersburg in a letter written in his own hand, promising me a private situation. This cold, proud man, careless and disdainful of me, after bringing me into the world and packing me off to strangers, knew nothing of me at all, and had never even regretted his conduct. Who knows? Perhaps he had only a vague and confused idea of my existence, for it appeared afterwards that the money for my maintenance in Moscow had not been furnished by him, but by other people. Yet the summons of this man who so suddenly remembered me and deigned to write to me with his own hand by flattering me decided my fate. Strange to say, what pleased me in his note, one tiny sheet of paper, was that he said not a word about the university, did not ask me to change my mind, did not blame me for not wanting to continue my studies, did not, in fact, trot out any parental flourishes of the kind usual in such cases, and yet this was wrong of him, since it betrayed more than anything his lack of interest in me. I resolved to go, the more readily because it would not hinder my great idea. I'll see what will come of it, I argued. In any case, I shall associate with him only for a time, possibly a very short time, but as soon as I see that this step, tentative and trifling as it is, is keeping me from the great object, I shall break off with them, throw up everything, and retreat into my shell. Yes, into my shell. I shall hide in it like a tortoise. This comparison pleased me very much. I shall not be alone, I went on musing as I walked about Moscow those last days like one possessed. I shall never be alone as I have been for so many awful years till now. I shall have my idea to which I will never be false, even if I like them all there, and they make me happy, and I live with them for ten years. It was, I may remark beforehand, just that impression, that is, just the twofold nature of the plans and objects definitely formed before leaving Moscow, and never out of my mind for one instant in Petersburg, for I hardly think there was a day in Petersburg which I had not fixed on beforehand as the final date for breaking off with them and going away. It was this, I say, that was, I believe, one of the chief causes of many of the indiscretions I have been guilty of during this year. Many nasty things, many even low things, and stupid ones, of course. To be sure, 
a father, something I had never had before, had appeared upon the scene. This thought intoxicated me as I made my preparations in Moscow and sat in the railway carriage. That he was my father would be nothing. I was not fond of sentimentality, but this man had humiliated me and had not cared to know me, while all those years I had been chewing away at my dreams of him, if one may use such an expression. From my childhood upward, my dreams were all colored by him, all hovered about him as the final goal. I don't know whether I hated him or loved him, but his figure dominated the future and all my schemes of life, and this happened of itself. It grew up with me. Another thing which influenced me in leaving Moscow was a tremendous circumstance, a temptation which even then, three months before my departure, before Petersburg had been mentioned, set my heart leaping and throbbing. I was drawn to this unknown ocean by the thought that I could enter it as the lord and master of other people's destinies, and what people, too. But the feelings that were surging in my heart were generous and not despotic. I hasten to declare it that my words may not be mistaken. Moreover, Verslav might think, if he ever deigned to think of me, that a small boy who had just left school, a raw youth, was coming, who would be agape with wonder at everything. And meanwhile, I knew all his private life and had about me a document of the utmost importance for which I know that now for a fact he would have given some years of his life if I had told him the secret at the time. But I notice that I am talking in riddles. One cannot describe feelings without facts. Besides which, there will be enough about all this in its proper place. It is with that object I have taken up my pen. Writing like this is like a cloud of words or the ravings of delirium. 8. Finally, to pass once for all to the 19th of September, I will observe briefly, and so to say cursorily, that I found them all, that is, Versilov, my mother and my sister, the latter I saw for the first time in my life, in difficult circumstances, almost destitute, or at least on the verge of destitution. I knew of this before leaving Moscow, but yet I was not prepared for what I saw. I had been accustomed from childhood to imagine this man, this future father of mine, in brilliant surroundings, and could not picture him except as the leading figure everywhere. Versilov had never shared the same lodgings with my mother, but had always taken rooms for her apart. He did this, of course, out of regard for their very contemptible proprieties. But here, they were all living together in a little wooden lodge in a back street in the Semyonovsky Polk. All their things were in pawn, so that without Versilov's knowledge, I gave my mother my secret 60 rubles. Secret, because I had saved them up in the course of two years out of my pocket money, which was five rubles a month. I had begun saving from the very day I had conceived my idea. And so Versilov must know nothing about the money. I trembled at the thought of that. My help was like a drop in the ocean. My mother worked hard and my sister too took in sewing. Versilov lived in idleness, indulged his whims, and kept up a number of his former rather expensive habits. He grumbled terribly, especially at dinner, and he was absolutely despotic in all his ways. But my mother, my sister, Tatyana Pavlovna, and the whole family of the late Andronikov, the head of some department, who used also to manage Versilov's affairs and had died three months before, consisting of innumerable women, groveled before him as though he were a fetish. I had not imagined this. I may remark that nine years before he had been infinitely more elegant. I have said already that I had kept the image of him in my dreams, surrounded by a sort of brilliance, and so I could not conceive how it was possible after only nine years for him to look so much older and to be so worn out, I felt at once sad, sorry, ashamed. The sight of him was one of the most painful of my first impressions on my arrival. Yet he was by no means an old man. He was only 45. Looking at him more closely, I found in his handsome face something even more striking than what I had kept in my memory. It was less of the brilliance of those days, less external beauty, less elegance even, but life had, as it were, stamped on that face something far more interesting than before. Meanwhile, poverty was not the tenth or twentieth fraction of his misfortunes, and I knew that. 
There was something infinitely more serious than poverty, apart from the fact that there was still a hope that Versilov might win the lawsuit he had been contesting for the last year with the princes Sokolsky, and might in the immediate future come into an estate to the value of 70,000 or more. I have said above that Versilov had run through three fortunes in his life, and here another fortune was coming to his rescue again. The case was to be settled very shortly. It was just then that I arrived. It is true that no one would lend him money on his expectations. There was nowhere he could borrow, and meanwhile they had to suffer. Versilov visited no one, though he sometimes was out for the whole day. It was more than a year since he had been banished from society. In spite of all my efforts, this scandal remained for the most part a mystery, though I had been a whole month in Petersburg. Was Versilov guilty or not guilty? That was what mattered to me. That is what I had come to Petersburg for. Everyone had turned against him, among others, all the influential and distinguished people with whom he had been particularly clever in maintaining relations all his life, in consequence of rumors of an extremely low, and what was much worse in the eyes of the world, scandalous action which he was said to have committed more than a year ago in Germany. It was even reported that he had received a slap in the face from Prince Sokolsky, one of those with whom he was now in litigation, and had not followed it by a challenge. Even his children, the legitimate ones, his son and daughter, had turned against him and were holding aloof. It is true that through the influence of the Fanariotovs and old Prince Sokolsky, who had been a friend of Versilov, the son and daughter moved in the very highest circles. Yet, watching him all that month, I saw a haughty man who had rather cast off society than been cast off by it, so independent was his heir. But had he the right to look like that? That was the question that agitated me. I absolutely had to find out the whole truth at the earliest possible date, for I had come to judge this man. I still kept my power hidden from him, but I had either to accept him or to reject him altogether. But that would have been too painful to me, and I was in torment. I will confess it frankly at last. The man was dear to me. And meanwhile, I was living in the same flat with him, working and scarcely refraining from being rude. In fact, I did not refrain. After spending a month with him, I became more convinced every day that I could not possibly appeal to him for a full explanation. This man and his pride remained an enigma to me while he wounded me deeply. He was positively charming to me, and jested with me, but I should have liked quarrels better than such jests. There was a certain note of ambiguity about all my conversations with him, or more simply, a strange irony on his part. From our first meeting on my arrival from Moscow, he did not treat me seriously. I never could make out why he took up this line. It is true that by this means he succeeded in remaining impenetrable but I would not have humbled myself so far as to ask him to treat me seriously. Besides, he had certain wonderful and irresistible ways which I did not know how to deal with. In short, he behaved to me as though I were the greenest of raw youths, which I was hardly able to endure, though I knew it would be so. I, too, gave up talking seriously in consequence and waited. In fact, I almost gave up talking altogether, I waited for a person on whose arrival in Petersburg I might finally learn the truth. That was my last hope. In any case, I prepared myself for a final rupture and had already taken all necessary measures. I was sorry for my mother, but either him or me. That was the choice I meant to offer her and my sister. I had even fixed on the day, and meanwhile, I went to my work. End of chapter one. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. Part 1, Chapter 2 of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constant Garnett, Part 1, Chapter 2 1. 
On that 19th of September, I was also to receive my first salary for the first month of my work in Petersburg in my private situation. They did not ask me about this job, but simply handed me over to it, I believe, on the very first day of my arrival. This was very unmannerly and was almost my duty to protest. The job turned out to be a situation in the household of old Prince Sokolsky, but to protest then would have meant breaking off relations on the spot, and though I was not in the least afraid of that, it would have hindered the attainment of my primary objects. And so in silence I accepted the job for the time, maintaining my dignity by silence. I must explain from the very first that this Prince Sokolsky, a wealthy man and a privy counselor, was no relation at all of the Moscow princes of that name, who had been poor and insignificant for several generations past, with whom Versilov was contesting his lawsuit. It was only that they had the same name, yet the old prince took a great interest in them and was particularly fond of one of them who was, so to speak, the head of the family, a young officer. Versilov had till recently had an immense influence in this old man's affairs and had been his friend, a strange sort of friend, for the poor old prince, as I detected, was awfully afraid of him, not only at the time when I arrived on the scene, but had apparently been always afraid of him all through their friendship. They had not seen each other for a long time, however. The dishonorable conduct of which Versilov was accused concerned the old prince's family, but Tatiana Pavlovna had intervened, and it was through her that I was placing attendance on the old prince, who wanted a young man in his study. At the same time, it appeared that he was very anxious to do something to please Versilov, to make, so to speak, the first advance to him, and Versilov allowed it. The old man made the arrangement in the absence of his daughter, the widow of a general, who would certainly not have permitted him to take this step. Of this later, but I may remark that the strangeness of his relations with Versilov impressed me in the latter's favor. It occurred to the imagination that if the head of the injured family still cherished a respect for Versilov, the rumors of Versilov's scoundrelly behavior must be absurd, or at least exaggerated, and might have more than one explanation. It was partly this circumstance which kept me from protesting against the situation. In accepting it, I hoped to verify all this. Tatiana Pavlovna was playing a strange part at the time when I found her in Petersburg. I had almost forgotten her and had not at all expected to find her possessed of such influence. She had met me three or four times during my life in Moscow and had always turned up goodness knows where from, sent by someone or other whenever I needed fitting out to go into Tushard's boarding school or two and a half years later when I was being transferred to the grammar school and sent to board with Nikolai Semyonovich, a friend I shall never forget. She used to spend the whole day with me and inspect my linen and my clothes. She drove about the town with me, took me to Kuznetsky Street, bought me what was necessary, provided me with a complete outfit, in fact, down to the smallest box and penknife. All the while, she nagged at me, scolded me, reproached me, cross-examined me, quoting as examples to me various phantom boys among her relations and acquaintances who were all said to be better than I was. She even pinched me and actually gave me several vicious pokes. After fitting me out and installing me, she would disappear completely for several years. On this occasion, too, she turned up at once on my arrival to install me again. She was a spare little figure with a sharp nose like a beak and sharp little eyes like a bird's. She waited on Versilov like a slave and groveled before him as though he were the Pope, but she did it through conviction. But I soon noticed with surprise that she was respected by all and what was more known to everyone everywhere. Old Prince Sokolsky treated her with extraordinary deference. It was the same thing with his family, the same with Versilov's haughty children, the same with the Fenaryatovs, and yet she lived by taking in sewing and washing lace and fetched work from the shops. She and I fell out at the first word, for she thought fit to begin nagging at me just as she had done six years before. And from that time forward we quarreled every day, but that did not prevent us from sometimes talking, and I must confess that by the end of the month I began to like her, for her independent character, I believe. But I did not tell her so. I realized at once that I had only been given this post at the old invalid prince's in order to amuse him, and that that was my whole duty. Naturally, this was humiliating, and I should at once have taken steps, but the queer old fellow soon made an unexpected impression upon me. 
I felt something like compassion for him, and by the end of the month, I had become strangely attached to him. Anyway, I gave up my intention of being rude. He was not more than 60, however, but there had been a great to-do with him a year and a half before, when he suddenly had a fit. He was traveling somewhere and went mad on the way, so there was something of a scandal of which people talked in Petersburg. As is usual in such cases, he was instantly taken abroad, but five months later he suddenly reappeared perfectly well, though he gave up the service. Versilov asserted seriously, and with notable heat, that he had not been insane at all, but had only had some sort of nervous fit. I promptly made a note of Versilov's warmth about it. I may observe, however, that I was disposed to share his opinion. The old man only showed perhaps an excessive frivolity at times, not quite appropriate to his years, of which, so they say, there was no sign in him before. It was said that in the past he had been a counselor of some sort, and on one occasion had quite distinguished himself in some commission with which he had been charged. After knowing him for a whole month, I should never have supposed he could have any special capacity as a counselor. People observed, though I saw nothing of it, that after his fit, he developed a marked disposition to rush into matrimony, and it was said that he had more than once reverted to this idea during the last 18 months, that it was known in society and a subject of interest. But as this weakness by no means fell in with the interests of certain persons of the prince's circle, the old man was guarded on all sides. He had not a large family of his own. He had been a widower for 20 years and had only one daughter, the general's widow, who was now daily expected from Moscow. She was a young person whose strength of will was evidently a source of apprehension to the old man. But he had masses of distant relatives, principally through his wife, who were all almost beggars, besides a multitude of protégés of all sorts, male and female, all of whom expected to be mentioned in his will, and so they all supported the general's widow in keeping watch over the old man. He had, moreover, had one strange propensity from his youth up. I don't know whether it was ridiculous or not, for making matches for poor girls. He had been finding husbands for the last 25 years for distant relations, for the stepdaughters of his wife's cousins, for his goddaughters. He even found a husband for the daughter of his house porter. He used to take his protégés into his house when they were little girls, provide them with governesses and French mademoiselles, then have them educated in the best boarding schools and finally marry them off with a dowry. The calls upon him were continually increasing. When his protégés were married, they naturally produced more little girls, and all these little girls became his protégés. He was always having to stand as godfather. The whole lot turned up to congratulate him on his birthdays, and it was all very agreeable to him. I noticed at once that the old man had lurking in his mind a painful conviction. It was impossible to avoid noticing it, indeed, that everyone had begun to look at him strangely, that everyone had begun to behave to him not as before, not as to a healthy man. This impression never left him, even at the liveliest social functions. The old man had become suspicious, had begun to detect something in everyone's eyes. He was evidently tormented by the idea that everyone suspected him of being mad. He sometimes looked mistrustfully, even at me. And if he had found out that someone was spreading or upholding such rumors, the benevolent old man would have become his implacable foe. I beg that this circumstance may be noted. I may add that it was what decided me from the first day not to be rude to him. In fact, I was glad if I were able sometimes to amuse or entertain him. I don't think that this confession can cast any slur on my dignity. The greater part of his money was invested. He had since his illness become a partner in a large joint stock enterprise, a very safe one, however. And though the management was in other hands, he took a great interest in it too, attended the shareholders' meetings, was appointed a director, presided at the board meetings, opposed motions, was noisy, and obviously enjoyed himself. He was very fond of making speeches. Everyone could judge of his brain anyway. And in general, he developed a great fancy for introducing profound reflections and bon mots in his conversation, even in the intimacy of private life. I quite understand it. On the ground floor of his house, there was something like a private office where a single clerk kept books and accounts and also managed the house. 
This clerk was quite equal to the work alone, though he had some government job as well, but by the prince's own wish I was engaged to assist him. But I was immediately transferred to the prince's study and often had no work before me, not even books or papers to keep up appearances. I am writing now sobered by time, and about many things feel now almost like an outsider. But how can I describe the depression, I recall it vividly at this moment, that weighed down my heart in those days, and still more, the excitement which reached such a pitch of confused feverishness that I did not sleep at night, all due to my impatience to the riddles I had set myself to solve. 2. To ask for money, even a salary, is a most disgusting business, especially if one feels in the recesses of one's conscience that one has not quite earned it. Yet the evening before, my mother had been whispering to my sister, apart from Verslav, so as not to worry Andrei Petrovich, that she intended to take the icon, which for some reason was particularly precious to her, to the pawnbrokers. I was to be paid 50 rubles a month, but I had no idea how I should receive the money. Nothing had been said to me about it. Meeting the clerk downstairs three days before, I inquired of him whom one was to ask for one's salary. He looked at me with a smile as though of astonishment. He did not like me. Oh, you get a salary? I thought that on my answering, he would add, what for? But he merely answered dryly that he knew nothing about it and buried himself in the ruled exercise book into which he was copying accounts from some bills. He was not unaware, however, that I did something. A fortnight before I had spent four days over work he had given me, making a fair copy and, as it turned out, almost a fresh draft of something. It was a perfect avalanche of ideas of the princes which he was preparing to present to the board of directors. These had to be put together into a whole and clothed in suitable language. I spent a whole day with the prince over it afterwards, and he argued very warmly with me, but was well satisfied in the end. But I don't know whether he read the paper or not. I say nothing of the two or three letters, also about business, which I wrote at his request. It was annoying to me to have to ask for my salary, because I had already decided to give up my situation for saying that I should be obliged through unavoidable circumstances to go away. When I waked up and dressed that morning in my garret upstairs, I felt that my heart was beating, and though I poo-pooed it, yet I was conscious of the same excitement as I walked towards the prince's house. That morning there was expected a woman whose presence I was reckoning upon for the explanation of all that was tormenting me. This was the prince's daughter, the young widow of General Amakov, of whom I have spoken already, and was bitterly hostile to Verslov. At last I have written that name. I had never seen her, of course, and could not imagine how I should speak to her, or whether I should speak, but I imagined, perhaps on sufficient grounds, that with her arrival there would be some light thrown on the darkness surrounding Verslav in my eyes. I could not remain unmoved. It was frightfully annoying that at the very outset I should be so cowardly and awkward. It was awfully interesting and still more sickening. Three impressions at once. I remember every detail of that day. My old prince knew nothing of his daughter's probable arrival and was not expecting her to return from Moscow for a week. I had learnt this the evening before quite by chance. Tatiana Pavlovna, who had received a letter from Mademoiselle Amakov, let it out to my mother. Though they were whispering and spoke in veiled allusions, I guessed what was meant. Of course, I was not eavesdropping. I simply could not avoid listening when I saw how agitated my mother was at the news of this woman's arrival. Versilov was not in the house. I did not want to tell the old prince because I could not help noticing all that time how he was dreading her arrival. He had even let drop three days before, though only by a timid and remote hint, that he was afraid of her coming on my account, that is, that he would have trouble about me. I must add, however, that in his own family he preserved his independence and was still master in his own house, especially in money matters. My first judgment of him was that he was a regular old woman, but I was afterwards obliged to revise my opinion and to recognize that if he were an old woman, there was still a fund of obstinacy, if not of real manliness, in him. There were moments when one could hardly do anything with him in spite of his apprehensive and yielding character. Verslav explained this to me more fully later. 
I recall now with interest that the old prince and I scarcely ever spoke of his daughter. We seemed to avoid it. I, in particular, avoided it, while he, on his side, avoided mentioning Versilov, and I guessed that he would not answer if I were to ask him one of the delicate questions which interested me so much. If anyone cares to know what we did talk about all that month, I must answer that we really talked of everything in the world, but always of the queerest things. I was delighted with the extraordinary simplicity with which he treated me. Sometimes I looked with extreme astonishment at the old man and wondered how he could ever have presided at meetings. If he had been put into our school and in the fourth class, too, what a nice schoolfellow he would have made. More than once, too, I was surprised by his face. It was very serious-looking, almost handsome and thin. He had thick, curly gray hair, wide-open eyes, and he was besides slim and well-built. But there was an unpleasant, almost unseemly peculiarity about his face. It would suddenly change from excessive gravity to an expression of exaggerated playfulness, which was a complete surprise to a person who saw him for the first time. I spoke of this to Versilov, who listened with curiosity. I fancy that he had not expected me to be capable of making such observations. He observed casually that this had come upon the prince since his illness, and probably only of late. We used to talk principally of two abstract subjects, of God and of his existence, that is, whether there was a God or not, and of women. The prince was very religious and sentimental. He had in his study a huge stand of icons with a lamp burning before them, but something seemed to come over him, and he would begin expressing doubts of the existence of God and would say astounding things, obviously challenging me to answer. I was not much interested in the question, speaking generally, but we both got very hot about it and quite genuinely. I recall all those conversations, even now with pleasure, but what he liked best was gossiping about women, and he was sometimes positively disappointed at my disliking the subject of conversation and making such a poor response to it. He began talking in that style as soon as I went in that morning. I found him in a jocose mood though I had left him the night before extremely melancholy. Meanwhile, it was absolutely necessary for me to settle the matter of the salary before the arrival of certain persons. I reckoned that that morning we should certainly be interrupted. It was not for nothing my heart was beating, and then perhaps I should not be able to bring myself to speak of money. But I did not know how to begin about money, and I was naturally angry at my stupidity. And as I remember now in my vexation at some too jocular question of his, I blurted out my views on women point blank and with great vigor, and this led him to be more expansive with me than ever. 3. I don't like women because they've no manners, because they are awkward, because they are not self-reliant and because they wear unseemly clothes, I wound up my long tirade incoherently. My dear boy, spare us, he cried, immensely delighted, which enraged me more than ever. I am ready to give way and be trivial only about trifles. I never give way in things that are really important. In trifles, in little matters of etiquette, you can do anything you like with me and I curse this peculiarity in myself. From a sort of putrid good nature, I've sometimes been ready to knuckle under to some fashionable snob simply flattered by his affability, or I've let myself be drawn into argument with a fool, which is more unpardonable than anything. All this is due to lack of self-control and to my having grown up in seclusion, but the next day it would be the same thing again, that's why I was sometimes taken for a boy of 16, but instead of gaining self-control, I prefer even now to bottle myself up more tightly than ever in my shell. I may be clumsy, but goodbye, however misanthropic that may seem. I say that seriously and for good, but I don't write this with reference to the prince or even with reference to that conversation. I'm not speaking for your entertainment, I almost shouted at him. I am speaking from conviction. But how do you mean that women have no manners and are unseemly in their dress? That's something new. They have no manners. Go to the theater. Go for a walk. Every man knows the right side of the road. When they meet, they step aside. He keeps to the right, I keep to the right. A woman that is a lady, it's ladies I'm talking about, 
dashes straight at you as though she doesn't see you, as though you were absolutely bound to skip aside and make way for her. I'm prepared to make way for her as a weaker creature, but why has she the right? Why is she so sure it's my duty? That's what's offensive. I always curse when I meet them. And after that, they cry out that they're oppressed and demand equality, a fine sort of equality when she tramples me underfoot and fills my mouth with sand. With sand? Yes, because they're not decently dressed. It's only depraved people don't notice it. In the law courts, they close the doors when they're trying cases of indecency. Why do they allow it in the streets where there are more people? They openly hang bustles on behind to look at as though they had fine figures. Openly. I can't help noticing. The young lad notices it too. And the child that's growing into a boy notices it too. It's abominable. Let old rakes admire them and run after them with their tongues hanging out. But there is such a thing as the purity of youth which must be protected. One can only despise them. They walk along the parade with trains half a yard long behind them, sweeping up the dust. It's a pleasant thing to walk behind them. You must run to get in front of them or jump on one side or they'll sweep pounds of dust into your mouth and nose. And what's more, it's silk and they'll drag it over the stones for a couple of miles simply because it's the fashion when their husbands get 500 rubles a year in the Senate. That's where bribes come in. I've always despised them. I've cursed them aloud and abused them. Though I described this conversation somewhat humorously in the style that was characteristic of me at that time, my ideas are still the same. And how do you come off? The prince queried. I curse them and turn away. They feel it, of course, but they don't show it. They prance along majestically without turning their heads. But I only came to actual abuse on one occasion with two females, both wearing tails on the parade. Of course, I didn't use bad language, but I said aloud that long tails were offensive. Did you use that expression? Of course I did. To begin with, they trample upon the rules of social life, and secondly, they raise the dust, and the parade is meant for all. I walk there, other men walk, Fyodor, Ivan, it's the same for all. So that's what I said, and I dislike the way women walk all together when you look at their back view. I told them that too, but only hinted at it. But my dear boy, you might get into serious trouble. They might have hauled you off to the police station. They couldn't do anything. They had nothing to complain of. A man walks beside them talking to himself. Everyone has the right to express his convictions to the air. I spoke in the abstract without addressing them. They began wrangling with me of themselves. They began to abuse me. They used much worse language than I did. They called me milksop. Said I ought to go without my dinner. Called me a nihilist and threatened to hand me over to the police. Said that I'd attack them because they were alone and weak women, but if there had been a man with them, I should soon sing another tune. I very coolly told them to leave off annoying me, and I would cross to the other side of the street, and to show them that I was not in the least afraid of their men, and was ready to accept their challenge, I would follow them to their house, walking twenty paces behind them, then I would stand before the house and wait for their men, and so I did. You don't say so. Of course, it was stupid, but I was roused. They dragged me over two miles in the heat as far as the institutions. They went into a wooden house of one story, a very respectable looking one, I must admit. One could see in at the windows a great many flowers, two canaries, three pug dogs, and engravings and frames. I stood for half an hour in the street, pacing the house. They peeped out two or three times, then pulled down all the blinds, Finally, an elderly government clerk came out of the little gate, judging from his appearance he had been asleep and had been waked up on purpose. He was not actually in a dressing gown, but he was in a very domestic-looking attire. He stood at the gate, folded his hands behind him, and proceeded to stare at me, I at him. Then he looked away, then gazed at me again, and suddenly began smiling at me. I turned and walked away. My dear boy... How Schiller-esque. I've always wondered at you, with your rosy cheeks, your face blooming with health, and such an aversion, one may say, for women. How is it possible that woman does not make a certain impression on you at your age? Why, 
When I was a boy of eleven, mon cher, my tutor used to notice that I looked too attentively at the statues in the summer gardens. You would like me to take up with some Josephine here and come and tell you all about it? Rather not. I saw a woman completely naked when I was 13. I've had a feeling of disgust ever since. Do you mean it? Le Chien Enfant, about a fresh, beautiful woman, there's a scent of apples. There's nothing disgusting. In the little boarding school I was at before I went to the grammar school, there was a boy called Lambert. He was always thrashing me, for he was three years older than I was, and I used to wait on him and take off his boots. When he was going to be confirmed, an abbe called Rigaud came to congratulate him on his first communion, and they dissolved in tears on each other's necks, and the abbe hugged him tightly to his bosom. I shed tears too and felt very envious. He left school when his father died, and for two years I saw nothing of him. Then I met him in the street. He said he would come and see me. By that time, I was at the grammar school and living at Nikolai Semyonovich's. He came in the morning, showed me 500 rubles, and told me to go with him. Though he had thrashed me two years before, he had always wanted my company, not simply to take off his boots, but because he liked to tell me things. He told me that he had taken the money that day out of his mother's desk, to which he had made a false key, for legally all his father's money was his, and so much the worse for her if she wouldn't give it to him. He said that the Abbe Rigaud had been to lecture him the day before, that he'd come in, stood over him, begun whimpering, and described all sorts of horrors, lifting up his hands to heaven. And I pulled out a knife and told him I'd cut his throat. He pronounced it throat. We went to Kuznetsky Street. On the way, he informed me that his mother was the Abbe's mistress and that he'd found it out and he didn't care a hang for anything and that all they said about the sacrament was rubbish. He said a great deal more and I felt frightened. In Kuznetsky Street, he bought a double-barreled gun, a game bag, cartridges, a riding whip, and afterwards a pound of sweets. We were going out into the country to shoot and on the way, we met a bird catcher with cages of birds. Lambert bought a canary from him. In a wood, he let the canary go, as it couldn't fly far after being in the cage, and began shooting at it, but did not hit it. It was the first time in his life he had fired off a gun, but he had wanted to buy a gun years before. At two shards, even we were dreaming of one. He was almost choking with excitement. His hair was black, awfully black. His face was white and red. Like a mask, he had a long, aquiline nose, such as are common with Frenchmen, white teeth and black eyes. He tied the canary by a thread to a branch, and an inch away fired off both barrels, and the bird was blown into a hundred feathers. Then we returned, drove to an hotel, took a room, and began eating and drinking champagne. A lady came in. I remember being awfully impressed by her being so splendidly dressed. She wore a green silk dress. It was then I saw all that I told you about. Afterwards, when we had begun drinking, he began taunting and abusing her. She was sitting with nothing on. He took away her clothes, and when she began scolding and asking for her clothes to dress again, he began with all his might beating her with the riding whip on her bare shoulders. I got up, seized him by the hair, and so neatly that I threw him on the ground at once. He snatched up a fork and stuck it in my leg. Hearing the outcry, people ran in, and I had time to run away. Ever since then, it's disgusted me to think of nakedness. And believe me, she was a beauty. As I talked, the prince's face changed from a playful expression to one of great sadness. Mon pauvre font, I have felt convinced all along that there have been very many unhappy days in your childhood. Please, don't distress yourself. But you were alone. You told me so yourself. But for that Lambert, you've described it so well, that canary, the confirmation, and shedding tears on the Abbe's breast. And only a year or so later, saying that of his mother and the Abbe, oh mon cher, the question of childhood in our days is truly awful. For a time, those golden heads, curly and innocent, flutter before one and look at one with their clear eyes like angels of God or little birds and afterwards and afterwards it turns out that it would have been better if they had not grown up at all.
How soft you are, prince. It's as though you had little children of your own. Why, you haven't any, and never will have. Tiens, his whole face was instantly transformed. That's just what Alexandra Petrovna said the day before yesterday. He, he, Alexandra Petrovna Sinitsky, you must have met her here three weeks ago. Only fancy, the day before yesterday, in reply to my jocular remark that if I do get married, now I could set my mind at rest. There'd be no children, she suddenly said, and with such spite. And on the contrary, there certainly would be. People like you always have them. They'll arrive the very first year. You'll see. Hehe. <laughs> and they've all taken it into their heads for some reason that I'm going to get married. But though it was spiteful, I admit it was witty. Witty, but insulting. Oh, cher infant. One can't take offense at some people. There's nothing I prize so much in people as wit, which is evidently disappearing among us. Though what Alexandra Petrovna said can hardly be considered wit. What? What did you say? I said, catching at his words. One can't take offense at some people. That's just it. Some people are not worth noticing. An excellent principle. Just the one I need. I shall make note of it. You sometimes say the most delightful things, Prince. He beamed all over. Ne sais pas. Cher Infant, true wit is vanishing. The longer one lives, the more one sees it. Eh, mais, c'est moi qui connais les femmes. Believe me, the life of every woman, whatever she may profess, is nothing but a perpetual search for someone to submit to, so to speak a thirst for submission, and mark my words, there's not a single exception. Perfectly true, magnificent, I cried rapturously. Another time we should have launched into philosophical disquisitions on this theme lasting for an hour, but suddenly I felt as though something had bitten me, and I flushed all over. I suddenly imagined that, in admiring his bon mots, I was flattering him as a prelude to asking for money, and that he would certainly think so as soon as I began to ask for it. I purposely mention this now. Prince! I humbly beg you to pay me at once the fifty rubles you owe me for the month. I fired off like a shot in a tone of irritability that was positively rude. I remember, for I remember every detail of that morning, that there followed between us then a scene most disgusting in its realistic truth. For the first minute he did not understand me, stared at me for some time without understanding what money I was talking about. It was natural that he should not realize I was receiving a salary, and indeed why should I? It is true that he proceeded to assure me afterwards that he had forgotten, and when he grasped the meaning of my words, he instantly began taking out fifty rubles, but he was flustered and turned crimson. Seeing how things stood, I got up and abruptly announced that I could not take the money now, that in what I had been told about a salary they had made a mistake, or deceived me to induce me to accept the situation, and that I saw only too well now that I did nothing to earn one, for I had no duties to perform. The prince was alarmed and began assuring me that I was of the greatest use to him, that I should be still more useful to him in the future, and that fifty rubles was so little that he should certainly add to it, for he was bound to do so, and that he had made the arrangement himself with Tatiana Pavlovna, but had unpardonably forgotten it. I flushed crimson and declared resolutely that it was degrading for me to receive a salary for telling scandalous stories of how I had followed two draggle tales to the institutions, that I had not been engaged to amuse him, but to do work, and that if there was no work, I must stop it, and so on, and so on. I could never have imagined that anyone could have been so scared as he was by my words. Of course it ended in my ceasing to protest, and his somehow pressing the fifty rubles into my hand. To this day I recall with a blush that I took it. Everything in the world always ends in meanness. And what was worst of all, he somehow succeeded in almost proving to me that I had unmistakably earned the money, and I was so stupid as to believe it, and so it was absolutely impossible to avoid taking it. Cher, cher infant, he cried, kissing and embracing me. I must admit I was on the point of tears myself. Goodness knows why, though I instantly restrained myself, and even now I blush as I write it. My dear boy, you're like one of the family to me now. In the course of this month, you've won a warm place in my heart. In society, you get society, and nothing else. Katerina, 
Nikolaevna, that was his daughter's name, is a magnificent woman, and I'm proud of her. But she often, my dear boy, very often wounds me. And as for these girls, elles sont charmantes, and their mothers, who come on my birthday, they merely bring their embroidery and never know how to tell one anything. I've accumulated over 60 cushions embroidered by them, all dogs and stags. I like them very much, but with you I feel as if you were my own, not son, but brother. And I particularly like it when you argue against me. You're literary. You have read. You can be enthusiastic. I have read nothing, and I'm not literary at all. I used to read what I came across, but I've read nothing for two years, and I'm not going to read. Why aren't you going to? I have other objects. Cher, it's a pity at the end of your life you say, like me, j'ai ces temps, mais je ne sais rien de bon. I don't know in the least what I have lived in this world for, but I am so much indebted to you, and I should like, in fact, he suddenly broke off, and with an air of fatigue sank into brooding. After any agitation, and he might be overcome by agitation at any minute, goodness knows why, he generally seemed for some time to lose his faculties and his power of self-control, but he soon recovered so that it really did not matter. We sat still for a few minutes, his very full lower lip hung down. What surprised me most of all was that he had suddenly spoken of his daughter, and with such openness too. I put it down, of course, to his being upset. Cher enfant, you don't mind my addressing you so familiarly, do you? Broke from him suddenly. Not in the least. I must confess that at the very first I was rather offended by it and felt inclined to address you in the same way, but I saw it was stupid because you didn't speak like that to humiliate me. But he had forgotten his question and was no longer listening. Well, how's your father? he said, suddenly raising his eyes and looking dreamily at me. I winced. In the first place, he called Versilov my father, which he had never permitted himself to do before. And secondly, he began of himself to speak of Versilov, which he had never done before. He sits at home without a penny and is very gloomy, I answered briefly, though I was burning with curiosity. Yes, about money. His lawsuit is being decided today and I'm expecting Prince Sergei as soon as he arrives. He promised to come straight from the court to me. Their whole future turns on it. It's a question of sixty or seventy thousand. Of course, I've always wished well to Andrei Petrovich, Versilov's name, and I believe he'll win the suit and Prince Sergei has no case. It's a point of law. The case will be decided today, I cried, amazed. The thought that Versilov had not deigned to tell me even that was a great shook to me. Then he hasn't told my mother. Perhaps not anyone, it suddenly struck me. What strength of will. Then is Prince Sikolsky in Petersburg? Was another idea that occurred to me immediately. He arrived yesterday. He has come straight from Berlin expressly for this day. That too was an extremely important piece of news for me, and he would be here today, that man who had given him a slap in the face. Well, what then? The old prince's face suddenly changed again. He'll preach religion as before and, and maybe run after little girls, unfledged girls again. <laughs> There's a very funny little story about that going about even now. He, <laughs> Who will preach? Who will run after little girls? Andrei Petrovich. Would you believe it? He used to pester us all in those days. Where are we going, he would say. What are we thinking about? That was about it, anyway. He frightened and chastened us. If you're religious, he'd say, why don't you become a monk? That was about what he expected. Mikhail Idi, if it's right, isn't it too severe? He was particularly fond of frightening me with the Day of Judgment. Me, of all people. I've noticed nothing of all this, and I've been living with him a month, I answered, listening with impatience. I felt fearfully vexed that he hadn't pulled himself together and was rambling on so incoherently. It's only that he doesn't talk about that now, but believe me, it was so. He's a clever man, and undoubtedly very learned, but is his intellect quite sound? All this happened to him after his three years abroad, and I must own he shocked me very much and shocked everyone. Cher enfant, j'aime les bandes.
I believe, I believe as much as I can, but I really was angry at the time. Supposing I did put on a frivolous manner, I did it on purpose because I was annoyed. And besides, the basis of my objection was as serious as it has been from the beginning of the world. If there is a higher being, I said, and he has a personal existence, and isn't some sort of diffused spirit for creation, and is some sort of fluid, for that's even more difficult to understand, where does he live? Sete bet, no doubt, my dear boy, but... You know, all the arguments come to that. Un domicile is an important thing. He was awfully angry. He had become a Catholic out there. I've heard that too, but it was probably nonsense. I assure you by everything that's sacred, you've only to look at him. But you say he's changed, but in those days how he used to worry us all. Would you believe it? He used to behave as though he were a saint and his relics were being displayed. He called us to account for our behavior, I declare he did, relics, in voila un outre. It's all very well for a monk or a hermit, but here was a man going about in a dress coat and all the rest of it. And then he sets up as a saint. A strange inclination in a man in good society and a curious taste, I admit. I say nothing about that, no doubt all that's sacred and anything may happen. Besides, this is all l'inconnu but it's positively unseemly for a man in good society. If anything happened to me and the offer were made me, I swear I should refuse it. I go and dine today at the club and then suddenly make a miraculous appearance as a saint? Why, I should be ridiculous. I put all that to him at the time. He used to wear chains. I turned red with anger. Did you see the chains yourself? I didn't see them myself, but... Then let me tell you that all that is false, a tissue of loathsome fabrications, the calumny of enemies, that is, of one chief, an inhuman enemy, for he has only one enemy, your daughter. The old prince flared up in his turn. Mon cher, I beg and insist that from this time forth you never couple with that revolting story the name of my daughter. I stood up. He was beside himself. His chin was quivering. Set the store in farm. I did not believe it. I never would believe it. But they tell me, believe it. Believe it. I... At that instant, a footman came in and announced visitors. I dropped into my chair again. Four. Two ladies came in. They were both young and unmarried. One was a stepdaughter of a cousin of the old prince's deceased wife or something of the sort a protege of his for whom he had already set aside a dowry and who, I mention it with a view to later events, had money herself. The other was Anna Andreevna Versilov, the daughter of Versilov, three years older than I. She lived with her brother in the family of Mademoiselle Fenariotov. I had only seen her once before in my life, for a minute in the street, though I had had an encounter also very brief with her brother in Moscow. I may very possibly refer to this encounter later if I have space, that is, for it is hardly worth recording. Anna Andreevna had been from childhood a special favorite of the old prince. Versilov's acquaintance with the prince dated from very long ago. I was so overcome by what had just happened that I did not even stand up on their entrance, though the old prince rose to greet them. Afterwards, I thought it would be humiliating to get up, and I remained where I was. What overwhelmed me most was the prince's having shouted at me like that three minutes before, and I did not know whether to go away or not. But the old man, as usual, had already forgotten everything, and was all pleasure and animation at the sight of the young ladies. At the very moment of their entrance, he hurriedly whispered to me with a rapid change of expression and a mysterious wink, Look at Olympiada. Watch her. Watch her. I'll tell you why after. I did look at her rather carefully, but I saw nothing special about her. She was a plump, not very tall young lady with exceedingly red cheeks. Her face was rather pleasing, of the sort that materialists like. She had an expression of kindness, perhaps with a touch of something different. She could not have been very brilliant intellectually, that is, not in the higher sense, for one could see cunning in her eyes. She was not more than nineteen. In fact, there was nothing remarkable about her. In our school, we should have called her a cushion. I only give this minute description of her because it will be useful later on.
Indeed, all I have written hitherto with apparently such unnecessary detail is all leading up to what is coming and is necessary for it. It will all come in in its proper place. I cannot avoid it, and if it is dull, pray don't read it. Verisolov's daughter was a very different person. She was tall and somewhat slim, with a long and strikingly pale face and splendid black hair. She had large, dark eyes with an earnest expression, a small mouth, and most crimson lips. She was the first woman who did not disgust me by her horrid way of walking. She was thin and slender, however. Her expression was not altogether good-natured, but was dignified. She was twenty-two. There was hardly a trace of resemblance to Verslov in her features, and yet by some miracle there was an extraordinary similarity of expression. I do not know whether she was pretty. That is a matter of taste. They were both very simple in their dress, so that it is not worthwhile to describe it. I expected to be at once insulted by some glance or gesture by Mademoiselle Verslov, and I was prepared for it. Her brother had insulted me in Moscow the first time we ever met. She could hardly know me by sight, but no doubt she had heard I was in attendance on the prince. Whatever the prince did or proposed to do at once aroused interest and was looked upon as an event in the whole gang of his relations and expectant beneficiaries, and this was especially so with his sudden partiality for me. I knew for a fact that the old prince was particularly solicitous for Anna Andreevna's welfare and was on the lookout for a husband for her. But it is more difficult to find a suitor for Mademoiselle Versala than for the ladies who embroidered on canvas. And lo and behold, contrary to all my expectations, after shaking hands with the prince and exchanging a few light conventional phrases with him, she looked at me with marked curiosity, and seeing that I too was looking at her, bowed to me with a smile. It is true that she had only just come into the room, and so might naturally bow to anyone in it, but her smile was so friendly that it was evidently premeditated, and I remember it gave me a particularly pleasant feeling. And this, this is my dear young friend Arkady Andreevich Dol. The prince faltered, noticing that she bowed to me while I remained sitting, and he suddenly broke off. Perhaps he was confused at introducing me to her, that is, in reality, introducing a brother to a sister. The cushion bowed to me, too, but I suddenly leapt up with a clumsy scrape of my chair. It was a rush of simulated pride, utterly senseless, all due to vanity. Excuse me, prince, I am not Arkady Andreevich, but Arkady Makarovich, I rapped out abruptly, utterly forgetting that I ought to have bowed to the ladies. Damnation, take that unseemly moment. Metien cried the prince, tapping his forehead with his finger. "'Where have you studied?' I heard the stupid question drawled by the cushion, who came straight up to me. "'In Moscow, at the grammar school.' "'Ah, so I have heard. Is the teaching good there?' "'Very good.' I remained standing and answered like a soldier reporting himself. The young lady's questions were certainly not appropriate, but she did succeed in smoothing over my stupid outbreak and relieving the embarrassment of the prince, who was meanwhile listening with an amused smile to something funny Mademoiselle Verslov was whispering in his ear, evidently not about me. But I wondered why this girl, who was a complete stranger to me, should put herself out to smooth over my stupid behavior and all the rest of it. At the same time, it was impossible to imagine that she had addressed me quite casually. It was obviously premeditated. She looked at me with too marked an interest. It was as though she wanted me, too, to notice her as much as possible. I pondered over all this later, and I was not mistaken. What? Surely not today, the prince cried suddenly, jumping from his seat. Why didn't you know? Mademoiselle Versilov asked in surprise. Olympi, the prince didn't know that Katerina Nikolaevna would be here today. Why, it's to see her we've come. We thought she'd have arrived by the morning train and have been here long ago. She has just driven up to the steps. She has come straight from the station, and she told us to come up, and she would be here in a minute. And here she is. The side door opened, and that woman walked in. I knew her face already from the wonderful portrait of her that hung in the prince's study. I had been scrutinizing the portrait all that month. I spent three minutes in the study in her presence, and I did not take my eyes off her face for a second. But if I had not known her portrait, and had been asked after those three minutes what she was like, I could not have answered for all 
was confusion within me. I only remember from those three minutes the image of a really beautiful woman whom the prince was kissing and signing with the cross and who looked quickly at once the very minute she came in at me. I distinctly heard the prince muttering something with a little simper about his new secretary and mentioning my name, evidently pointing at me. Her face seemed to contract. She threw a vicious glance at me and smiled so insolently that I took a sudden step forward, went up to the prince and muttered, trembling all over and unable to finish my words. I believe my teeth were chattering. From this time I, I have business of my own. I'm going. And I turned and went out. No one said a word to me, not even the prince. They all simply stared. The old prince told me afterwards that I turned so white that he was simply frightened. But there was no need. End of part one, chapter two. Recording by Josh Stevens in Ashland, Oregon.